uh, Fred Brown, our epidemiologist, infectious disease expert that we try to get on the show every week because uh, this COVID-19 is something new every week, right, Fred? It is. We're, we're learning more every day. <laughs> now, one of the things I sent you last week was I received a study, I can't remember who did it, uh, looking at 14 different face masks that were available. And I know that's really important. I have to tell you, I bike every morning and I've had all sorts of problems with face masks because once I get up to speed and I'm pedaling very quickly, I, most of them don't work for me. I can't get enough air in. I feel like, you know, so this morning I tried a different one. I just tried the basic medical one, not an not N95, but your, you know, your basic one. That yeah. seemed to work the best. But I had bought a couple of different ones with vents in them to let more air in and more CO2 out. Didn't really work for me. Now, that's an extreme example, but I wanted to kind of set that up. So what, I suppose face masks would vary by what you're actually doing and how you want to use them, right? Yeah, that's right. You know, there, uh, so there are a few masks that really block, uh, uh, there, there are N99 masks that block almost everything that goes through and they can get down to less, less than a micron of, uh, of filtration levels. Uh, and those are for dusty and uh, dusty areas, especially, and for workers. We, uh, in the healthcare setting, we usually use the N95 masks and those uh, block uh, down to you know, 95% of, 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 of substances that are down to uh, three, uh, 0 0.3 microns. Now the average size of a of a coronavirus is 1.3 microns. So we're getting uh, rid of a lot of the, uh, of the a few of them are gonna sneak through, but we'll see from the Duke study that you mentioned uh, that that really is the most effective mask. You don't wanna use, well, if you're bicycling and you're away from people, uh, then uh, you could use the N95 mask that has the vent. The issue with the vent though, is that, and today you see airlines banning them uh, and, uh, uh, and, the Duke study especially mentioned that what happens is it actually concentrates your exhale, exhalations. And if you are sick, you're gonna push all, the ex, uh, all of your virus even more effectively uh, to uninfected people. Uh, and of course, 40% of us don't even know we have the disease. So there's a huge asymptomatic population out there. So if you're wearing these, these masks with vents on them, chances are you could be spreading the virus. And so we're trying to prevent that. Now, if you're a worker working in paint, paint aerosoling uh, uh, environments um, or, uh, or high dust environments, they'll, they'll, then they're very effective. And I'd recommend them there, but not, not, not in the general uh, uh, ho hospitals or, or general public settings. The, um, you mentioned bicycling. It turns out that we have the biggest problem with masks, um, mask adherence, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when we're in the gym. Only 41% of, uh, of people in gyms tend to be using masks. And that's because we're exhaling so hard that uh, we, know we, we have a buildup and, and, and it's hard for us to breathe effectively. Sure. When you're doing that, the, 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 the rule of thumb as a healthcare worker is, back off. Uh, in other words, don't breathe so hard that it's hard for you to breathe through your mask instead of taking off your mask. Because uh, when you're breathing that hard, uh, generally um, we've done studies on, on, on joggers and bikers. You should really be about 20 feet away from those guys who are really exhaling hard, singing, shouting. Uh, the, 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 you're really expelling a lot of air. Uh, so uh, that, that's usually, usually the rule of thumb. Our, our, best, our best protection is actually distance. Uh, and then we've got the masks to protect it when we come within that six feet radius. But if you can stay further away from people, then you're, 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 you're safe. And I, you know, you probably don't want to go away, wear your mask. Well, here we are in the fall. I, I live in Ann Arbor, as you know. Well, you live in Ann Arbor. That's well. right. That's and right. So uh, students are going to be coming back. Now, apparently from what I'm reading is most of the classes will be done online, but still, they're going to be in the dormitories. They're going to be, I don't know if they'll be in I don't know, by, by bars and restaurants. But, but let's, let's kind of walk through that. For a student or somebody that's working around these students or in a service environment, what kind of mask should they be wearing? So uh, I can show you the, the Duke study, and that's generally the, 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 the case for everybody, not just students. Uh, so maybe I should, we should go into that a little bit and talk about the mask, mask effect, effectiveness. Um, um, so you're right. At University of Michigan, 70% of the classes will be online. And I'm teaching class this year, uh, and I'll be on, online 100%. Usually we get together. We have lots of, uh, we actually have, you know, physical get-togethers and experiments and so on that we, work, that we run. Uh, and it's, there's a lot of learning that goes on there, but we just can't do it. 
Uh, so 70% um, uh, will not be uh, in class, uh, and then the rest of the 30 will either be hybrid uh, or or in uh, carefully spaced uh, uh, classes, uh, especially the big introductory classes. We're not going to push those at all. Yeah, so when I was a freshman, I remember sitting in on some classes that were 500 students in a hall. I don't think we're going to be seeing that, right? Believe it or not, that, that same hall is still in use, and the most you can get in there and still socially distance is 75 people. Really? In a, in a lecture hall of 500. Huh. Yeah. If you have a lecture hall of 250 students, those are the other big lecture hall sizes, 45 students. That's it. Huh. So even if we wanted to, we'd have to run classes all day. <laughs> or yeah. just like go through the number of students you'd have to do. So yeah, uh, so generally, um, we're going to have a lot of trouble controlling the virus. Uh, going back to school, you know, you know adults are having trouble uh, controlling the virus. And believe it or not, um, the biggest area of viral, uh, of, of, of what we're finding is the biggest, um, some of the some of the biggest outbreaks have occurred in family and personal friend uh, get-togethers of 10 to 100 people. Sure. Uh, and the reason for that is people let their guard down. You know, oh, I've been with Joe for a while, he's my friend, and you know, you get close to them. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times there's a lot of music playing, so you need to get close to here, and you're, you're expelling a lot every time you talk. And so, and because, you know, 40% of us are asymptomatic, we don't know we got it, especially the younger students. Uh, and so it's, it's extremely, it's, it, 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 they, they, we will have an outbreak there. There's pretty much no doubt about it until we have testing that we can do twice a week. Once you can test all the students twice a week, at that point, it becomes uh, much safer uh, because you know, everybody's, uh, you, you know everybody's health status. But until we have that or, or an effective vaccine, it's, uh, we're going to have outbreaks uh, and any, any school over 5,000. Uh, I think the them. last day or two, I also sent you over another story about this new test that tests the saliva. That's right. That's uh, so right. How effective would something like that be? Well, there are a couple of saliva tests uh, that, are, that are interesting. Um, uh, there's a group called Prediction Sciences out of Stanford. Uh, actually, they started at the University of Michigan and they moved to Stanford. Uh, and they have a, a, viral, a, a viral saliva test that's very accurate, very sensitive, very specific. They can scale it up to billions of tests a day. Wow. Uh, they're doing that now. Uh, it's, all, it's all solid state, so you don't need any reagents at all, which is sort of neat. So some of these new technologies are really, are really, uh, are, are really good. The one you're talking about is the one out of Yale. Uh, it is still a lab-based test, so it's not a test that you can that everyone can perform. Unfortunately, even though you're using saliva, which is easier to collect, obviously. But uh, because it's a lab-based test, what they've done is they they know they're going to have certain reagents. And our biggest problem with these tests that are occurring in the lab are the reagents and pulling everything together. So as you know, you've got nine different reagents that come together, and they have the swabs coming together, and that has, all all those have to come together in the right amounts. Uh, at the right time. Half of our supply chain is wasted right now. Half of our capacity is wasted because we can't get everything together in one package to, to, be, to be tested. And uh, uh, so what Yale did is they actually developed a whole series of different, uh, of different ways of processing their test. Uh, and so they have a multiple different reagents. So if you run out of one, you can use another and so on and uh, just with a slightly different mix. And that's very important. The other thing is it's, uh, the, the total cost of the test is between $1 and $5. So mm -hmm. you have to add in all the, all the transport costs. And you know, right now, you know, my guess is that's probably in excess of another 5 or $10, frankly. But you know, at least you're getting down to a, a, a level that you can uh, think about. What we really need, though, is a home test that everybody can do every day, all the time. And, when you get, and, and those are, are starting to become at least tested and available. There's a laminar flow test that the GSK is trying to roll out with Mammoth, which uses a nice CRISPR technology. Uh, and then there's a whole series of, of, uh, of paper-based technologies that are coming out. So there are, uh, but it, it, we're not as fast or, uh, as we should have been on this, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I went ahead and got my flu vaccine uh, just this week. Uh, and since I'm an older gentleman now, I got the maximum strength one. And my right. arm still hurts. So I got on Saturday and, and my arm still hurts. But uh, I thought I better get in ahead of everybody else and it's going to be getting that. Obviously, okay. it doesn't do much for COVID. But, but if you don't, I mean, the worst case scenario is you have the flu and you have the COVID at the same time. That'd be horrible, right? Uh, yeah, that's that's the scenario. You want to avoid that scenario. <laughs> and the other thing is, what, 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 when you have a vaccine, and we found this with polio vaccines and, and mumps vaccines, um, 
that if you have these vaccines, it resets, it recalibrates your immune system. Uh, and the flu, system, the flu shots also will do that. And so as an older person, what happens is our, our immune system starts to react a little bit slowly and then it overreacts. And that's what causes a lot of the deaths that we're seeing. And so by having the flu shot, a pol uh, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, the pneumonia shot or the mumps shot, uh, you can actually stimulate your, your immune system to respond appropriately uh, to the COVID virus, which is really important, actually. So would you, I mean, I had a pneumonia shot several years ago, uh, uh, and then would you recommend that people get booster shots for pneumonia yeah. shots, things like that? Yeah, you can get a booster shot, a a absolutely. And that, again, just sort of recalibrates your immune system so it kind of wakes up the, 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 the helper T cells and so on, and, and it's, uh, it is helpful uh, to have just a, a vaccine generally uh, in, in the space. The other thing that's nice about the flu shot is that if you do come down uh, with the flu, it's not going to be as virulent. Generally, what happens is we about, you know, we, we are, our flu shots are about 40 to 60 percent effective. And what happens is we actually reduce the virulence of the virus. So you, you have it for a shorter period of time and it's not quite as, you know, it's not quite as uh, heavy on, on, on your body. Uh, so that you really, especially the older generation, that, that, that really helps uh, with survival rates if you've got both COVID and flu at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So anything, uh, I know vaccine is the, is the charm that we're all waiting for. Uh, but there's yeah. been a lot of noise about maybe a vaccine by October. What do you think? Never going to happen. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. We have, we have two. You can choose one. Uh, one has 10% uh, safety, huge serious adversity, not just a, you know, a sore arm, but I'm talking about major systemic reaction uh, in China. So you can go to China and have that done. Uh, I think Saudi Arabia has a few of those shots, so you, you can get that done there. Uh, and of course, you can get the Russian one, which uh, Putin's daughter had. We're not sure which one, but uh, had the shot, and she said she had a little pain in the arm like you do but right now. The problem with the, uh, that, that is we're not, it has, it's only been up then actually injected into less than, slightly less than 100 people. <laughs> so, you know, that, 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 <laughs> the chances that, first of all, you've got any, you know, that we got some immune uh, response, and second, that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, going to be lasting is very low. Basically, what they did is they took a known adenovirus, a known, a known uh, virus, uh, and they put in uh, viruses that weren't actually the COVID virus, but related to the COVID virus from the common cold. And so we know it's going to be pretty safe, but we don't think it's going to be very effective. So probably next spring at the earliest before we really see something that you think would be effective or not? If we're very, very lucky and very, very fast and the FDA does some spe really special things, uh, then uh, yeah, early, early, early next year, uh, I, I think we might be able to get something as, as early as late December for, for very specialized uh, groups of people. Uh, and, uh, but, but for the general population, we're talking about at least spring of uh, 2021. And probably, and with problems, you know, to be something that's really effective and sanitizing and really impacts the disease at a, at a major level, we're probably talking end of 2021 earliest. Yeah, you know, and of course scale. then, the d scaling up the manufacturing of the vaccine. I mean, well, I'm, not, I'm not sure how many people we have in the world. I think it's somewhere around 8 billion. And billion. That would just be one shot. I mean, that's right. probably going to take multiple them. shots, right? <laughs> you need 15 billion. Yeah, most of these have, have to be boosted because uh, they have small amounts of, uh, generally, that they, the first time you take the shot, it gives you about the same level of antibody level as, you, as, as someone who is severely infected. And that, we don't think that's going to protect you long enough and, 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 and enough to really uh, give you the kind of protections we need a long term. So then you have to have a booster shot with almost all these, shot, uh, all these drugs. So we're talking about double the dosage. United States has spent $10, $9 billion so far on a vaccine that doesn't exist, just so we're in line to have access to all these vaccines. But when you look at the supply chains, um, the, the biggest area of challenge we've got is we don't have enough glass and we don't have enough stoppers and we don't have enough needles uh, to actually do uh, even three or 400 million times two, 800 million in the United States uh, doses, right? So uh, you know, right now, uh, not everyone wants to have the, uh, the vaccine. Only about half of half of people are want to want to have the have the vaccine. About thirty percent are holding back, saying let's wait and see. And about fifteen to twenty percent saying I don't want to have the vaccine at all, which puts us pretty much at the level. If, if if all the people who are on the on the on the wall right now on the fence right now move and say yes, I'm going to have the vaccine, then we're about at, uh, at the appropriate level for her, true herd immunity. But that means we've got a lot of convincing and 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 shots to to do. 
Um, and uh, the borosilicate production facilities, basically, you had in order to get your flu vaccine, uh, only have about half the capacity they need to in order to do the COVID. Uh, I'm sorry, about a third of the capacity they need to right now to, to actually fill all the COVID vials. And we've got other things to vaccinate as well. All of the pneumonia shots are coming up and so on. So um, th that that's actually, it's funny, but the the issue we've got isn't so much in the, well, we will have a huge, I'm working with a number of companies that are trying to produce uh, their their different manufacturing environments. And, you know, these, these are brand new kinds of environments, scale up's quite difficult. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the FDA, um, you know, has what they call CMC procedures, or control manu manufacturing control procedures that have to be very well uh, looked at, evaluated, validated that you have to evaluate the equipment, you got to evaluate the process, you got to validate the, uh, all the technicians, you got to validate all the inputs. Uh, and so that takes time uh, to make sure that we're producing things not at a 30,000 30, person scale, but at a 800 million level scale. You're talking about you know, a vast, a vast uh, size and difference in scale. When you have those changes in the scale, your clean outs have to be different. Uh, the way you flow the material through has to be different. Everything has to change. And so I'm helping a couple of companies do that right now. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty heartened by it, uh, but, <laughs> but we have a long way to go. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you, when, when, I, I, at some point, somebody's going to identify a vaccine that really works well. What's yep. the chances then of them giving, sharing that information with all the other vaccine makers out there. So we have a world response. I know this is a very competitive environment and everybody wants to make their big money and big pharma and all that. Is there any likelihood something like that could happen? Um, well, so uh, it's all about what they call intellectual property. Right. And what, 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 the, what, what the vaccine manufacturers will do is they'll, they, will, they will protect uh, and, and patent certain certain sequences, certain kinds of manufacturing capabilities, certain adjuvants, uh, certain processes. Uh, so their system is special. Now, eventually we can get to a, a space of, of becoming generic. Usually that happens after 20 years uh, of, of yeah, and that, at, that point, <laughs> at that point. I don't know if I'll be around in 20 years, but hey, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, then, then, then it's open season and you can you know, go, go after it yeah. generally. Even, even then it's usually a little bit longer because there are a lot of patents that sort of, what they do is they do patent, what they call patent thickets and they start to you know, um, uh, create Patents on top of patents on top of patents. So if you look at Humira, for example, which is a big drug, uh, you know, the original patent of that came off in 2015, and they're going to be patented until 20, 2023, as it turns out, in the United States, because they have manufacturing patents, they've got use case patents, they've got uh, active material patents. So all those different patents come into play to create an overall protection for the people who are developing it. So that's, that's a big, so if you look at the costing, what's interesting is the costing right now that the United States has negotiated, uh, in Europe they've negotiated $2.50 a test. Uh, our costing is between $4 a test, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, with AstraZeneca and $39, I'm sorry, not a test of vaccine, $39 for, um, two, uh, for, for the vaccines with Moderna. So you're getting into, now you'd have to double that because you're, you know, getting a booster shot. So, you know, you're getting into between 70, you know, $10 and $75 a shot. Um, so that's, you know, that's, it's getting expensive. And if you have to have these every six months, we're not sure how long it's going to last, maybe every year if we're lucky, maybe every, you know, even longer if we're even luckier, uh, then, you know, it's going to get expensive. Yeah, well, uh, we're 30, 300 million people. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the right. problem. We multiply it through, and it gets pretty expensive. <laughs> okay. So, so I, 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 you want to talk about the Duke study? Let me, let me. I, I put, yeah. I, you know, I've got this. I got the material. If, you, if you're interested, we can talk a little bit about the Duke study, which talks about masks. Yeah, absolutely. We got about ten minutes left. See if we can cover it in ten minutes. Oh, okay. We'll, we, we will, we'll, we'll, we'll do it like a movie. All right. <laughs> Let's take a look here. Here's, here's my screen. I don't know if you can see it. All right. Uh, not yet. No, now I can. Okay. All right. So this is sort of interesting. The reason we want to wear masks is because, uh, and here's the vaccination, pneumonia, polio vaccine. You can see that uh, I was talking about vaccinations and how that helps you. Um, so, and prior, uh, that, that, so that, that's a little bit of data there as, as well we talked about earlier. But the reason that we're worried, the uh, reason we all want to wear masks is because there's so many asymptomatics out there. People who are walking around, your friends, good friends, who absolutely have 
absolutely no symptoms and they're doing great. And, you know, they play tennis and they're, you know, looking really active and they have no symptoms, but they actually have live virus and they they cough and they breathe and they come close and all of a sudden you catch it and you may not be asymptomatic. You may actually have bad symptoms. Uh, and so that's why, you know, you want to have your friend wear the mask. And that's why you want to wear the mask. Um, and you can, you can see what was interesting is we're starting to see that viral load, um, the dose of the virus you get can actually, we think, affect how bad your symptoms are. So if you remember that doctor who died in China, he was, he was constantly seeing patients, he was getting a lot of viral load, and he was only 31 years old and he died because he had all this virus in him. Uh, and, he, and his immune system was just overwhelmed. So you don't wanna get into a situation where because you haven't, your, your friend hasn't worn the mask, you're not wearing the mask, you've got, a, you've got a big viral load uh, because you'll, you probably will have worse symptoms. Now, we don't know that 100% sure. It's not a perfect correlation, but we're, we're pretty sure. <laughs> you know, we're, we're getting, and we're getting sure by the day. So um, uh, you can see the surgically masked people had milder cases. People tend to get less sick uh, with, with, on lower doses. And the Argentinian uh, cruise ship, we, we had sort of two cruise ships that were going at the same time, one was this Argentinian cruise ship. And before that, we had the famous Diamond Princess in Japan. Diamond Princess, that was really early, no one wore masks. And um, you can see that the amount of people coming off the ship, only half of them were asymptomatic, which means they did, that, that, that half of them had very little symptoms and were pretty in pretty good shape. And Argent, the Argentinian cruise liner, it happened a few months later, everyone was wearing a mask and 81% of those patients were, were asymptomatic. So you get almost a, you, know, you get that between, you know, 50% if you don't wear a mask uh, in terms of a chance of going to be becoming asymptomatic, 50-50 versus a 20% chance of becoming symptomatic if you get sick and wearing a mask. So that, that helps, right? The mask helps you, we think. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So here, the... I have a little bit of, uh, there's a really interesting study about hospital rooms. And, and if you're in a hospital, the mask probably isn't going to, you know, if you're there for a long duration of time and you're breathing a lot of air, uh, the, the mask can help you uh, quite a bit. Um, and the reason you want people to wear masks in the hospital is because you can see that the, here are these two patients, they weren't married, wearing masks. And the, the, they, they had very good air filtration. They had six times removal an hour. We're, we're looking at, you know, even schools have like four times an hour. So this is six times an hour. They had ultraviolet rate radiation of all the air that went through the system. And they still found all of these viral particles in the air by the one guy who wasn't wearing a mask that was floating in and infecting the guy who did have a mask. He was asymptomatic and they realized, oh my gosh, the guy has COVID halfway through because the other guy got sick. And then they started measuring the viral levels in the, in the room. So if you're going into a hospital or you're in a nursing home, uh, there are all sorts of reasons you want a private room at this point. Because they won't, if they don't detect the, per, the fact that your roommate has the virus or all the people who visit the roommate, uh, you know, during the course of a sickness have the virus, you're going to get sick and you don't want to do that. So if you can afford it and your insurance covers it, get a private room, even if everyone's wearing a mask. Hmm. So here's the mask. Well, what, what kind of mask is the question, right? Right. And you can see uh, here is the data. And basically, this is, the, this is from a, a Duke study. Uh, and we had all sorts of original models of this stuff, and we had all sorts of very complicated, uh, you know, numbers and, and complicated uh, uh, um, math that kind of talked about, you know, what, what made a mask effective. It turns out that blockage makes the mask effective. It's all about pore size. It's all about electrophysical properties. So the N95 fitted mask, you, both you are protected and the person who you're, uh, who ha who, who you're talking to is protected. That's, and that's true with a surgical mask as well. You are protected and the person you're talking to are, are protected. Once you get into cottons and, 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 and non-surgical or non-N95 masks, at that point, it protects, uh, if, if, if you do not have, if you're wearing a mask and you do not have COVID and you're talking to someone who does have COVID, for more, for, and that person is less than six feet away from you and you're talking with them for more than 15 minutes, you've got a 70% chance of getting a dose of COVID. Wow. Yeah. If the guy who has, if the person you're talking to has, has COVID and he's wearing a mask and you do not have COVID and you do not wear a mask, you only have a 20% chance, right? So 
keeping the person who you're talking to having a mask on is really important. Both of you guys are wearing a mask, only 1.5% chance. So that's, that really, that's really where you want to be. Um, cotton, uh, so polypropylene is a little bit better blocker than cotton. So if you have a choice of wearing a mask uh, and it's got to be the fabric, choose polypropylene and try to layer it threefold thick. Uh, if you're going to wear cotton, threefold, uh, three th thickness uh, cotton layer of flannel was the best blocker. And uh, one was, of course, the worst blocker. Uh, so it all depends on the thickness and how many blockages you've got. You can see the knitted masks didn't do very well, right? What, what they looked at was droplet counts uh, that you were able to inhale through the mask. Uh, and you can see the graph they did, they had a laser beam, they breathed through the mask, you could see how much uh, particles, and they had a particle counter, uh, was going through the mask as a result of that breath. Uh, and over, over time, you can see how much uh, slowly so, so developed. Um, the bandanas are almost worse than nothing. <laughs> so, so the people who have the bandanas, it just pu pushes your, your, your breath downward. That's not so effective. And my guess, they didn't test it. I'm, I'm disappointed they didn't. My guess is that probably face shields are similar to bandanas. In mm. this and so um, I would beware of people who are only wearing a face shield. Certainly stay away from guys who are only wearing bandanas. The worst thing you can do is wear a fleece. You know why? Why? It turns out that the fleece is actually aerosol, the droplets. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> so you push it through and it actually makes the droplet smaller and, 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 and more widespread and in the air longer. So whatever you do, don't wear a fleece because it actually is worse than having nothing. <laughs> so mm. that, was, that was very fascinating, I thought. So that kind of gives you a sense. N95 is best. Get it if you can. Surgical masks, don't, but don't wear the one with a, a valve. Surgical masks are, 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 are about as good if you can get them. They use the electrostatic, electrostatic shut stop. Polypropylene, slightly better than but cotton, but cotton breathes better. So you want to make kind of, there's a trade-off there. If you're going to get cotton, three layers thick. Don't wear bandanas. Don't wear knitted. Don't wear fleeces. All right. Two minutes left. So uh, minutes what can left. we sum up in two minutes? Mask hair. Take care of your mask. It's like underwear. Wear, wash it every day. Put it in some bleach every day, uh, and then throw it in, the hot, in a hot dryer. If you start seeing fraying around the ears, probably not a good mask anymore, especially for N95 and surgical masks. Don't wear it again. When you take off the mask, take it off on the sides. Don't hold the front because it's full of crud. So you know, then you have to wash your hands after after you do it. If your wet mask gets wet, throw it out. It's not going to be useful anymore. It's going to block the pores. And if you have an N95 mask, put it in the sun for three hours. Um, that's, uh, uh, that, that, that's, uh, what, what, what we recommend at this point. And, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's some of the stuff on masks. Well, we need to get you to put your slides up on your website. I'm not sure if you're okay. doing it. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I'm not doing that. I should do that. I don't know if you want to, maybe we can just post the, uh, post it on Fred, uh, fredbrown.com. If you want to just post a link. Why not? Yes. Uh, that's, okay. that's the next thing I was going to say. You can sure. find out more information at fredbrown.com. Additional four-year students love Lawrence Technological University's thriving campus life, but LTU has always met non-traditional students' needs too. Lawrence Tech offers over 100 degree and certificate programs that can get adult students started or back on track. And most of our classes are conveniently offered evenings at our beautiful Southfield campus or online so you can balance your social, family, and work life even while you power up your career. Lawrence Tech, where blue devils dare.